Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Some 615,000 visitors a year flock to the hard-packed gray sands of Padre Island National Seashore along the Gulf Coast of Texas. Mild winter temperatures here allow the National Seashore to be fully enjoyed year-round, although summertime visitors can expect relentless heat despite the epic gulf breezes that blow nonstop. This completely undeveloped National Seashore boasts an abundance of natural wonders in its tidal flats, dunes, and grasslands. Ample solitude can be found on its 65-mile stretch of beach, including 60 miles that are only accessible by four-wheel drive. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. This week, the traveler's Lynn Riddick takes an in-depth look at Padre Island National Seashore and finds that not only is it a popular destination for campers, windsurfers, and anglers, but history buffs might find intrigue in the remnants of early settlements, cattle ranches, and military installations found there. Full of stunning photography and thought-provoking reads, Smokey's Life is a biannual magazine produced by Great Smoky Mountains Association. Members receive it free of charge each spring and fall, and it is available for purchase in retail stores throughout Great Smoky Mountains National Park and online at smokiesinformation.org. The Everglades Foundation, the only organization whose sole mission is to restore and protect America's Everglades. Learn more at evergladesfoundation.org. Whether it be strategy, business planning, change management, board development, executive search, or diversity planning, Petrero Group is here to help. They mix a depth of experience in the parks and land space with a breadth of best practices from other industries. For more information or to schedule a preliminary conversation, go to potrerogroup.com. P-O-T-R-E-R-O group.com. Padre Island National Seashore sits along the coastal bend of Texas on the Gulf of Mexico, south of Corpus Christi. As the longest undeveloped barrier island in the United States, there's 130,000 acres here to enjoy and protect. Almost as soon as you drive past the Malakite Visitor Center, the asphalt road abruptly ends and you find yourself driving south along the beach. To learn more about this unique unit of the Park Service, I caught up with Shelley Todd. She leads the Resource Management Division here at Padre Island National Seashore. Hi Shelley, welcome to The Traveler. Thanks for having me. Why don't you start off by describing the National Seashore for us, how long, how wide, and its natural characteristics. Sure. So Padre Island itself is about 113 miles from north to south. Our part of it, Padre Island National Seashore, on the Gulf side is about 65 miles long. And on the Laguna Madre side, it's about 70 miles long. It varies between a mile and three miles wide. There are a few sections that are a little skinnier than that and a few sections that are a little wider than that. But mostly it's between a mile and three miles wide. And it's made up of a variety of habitats, including coastal prairie, dunes, beach, tidal flats, and a lot of wetlands. Well, I want to talk more about the natural wonders of the seashore, but first let's talk about the history here. How did Padre Island get its name? So that comes from Padre Nicholas Bali, sometimes pronounced Bayi. I'm not quite sure exactly how he would have pronounced it. But he came and was, uh, he and his nephew, he was a Catholic priest, he and his nephew were the first to do cattle ranching on the island as a result of a Spanish land grant that they acquired in 1820. And so from 1820 forward until 1970, the island was used for open range cattle ranching uh, for about a hundred years, roughly, um, by Bayi and his descendants. And then after him, it was Patrick Dunn and his descendants. Are there any old structures remaining from those ranching days here? There are. So from the Dunn family, their operation, they had what we call line camps. So they are cultural landscapes, and one of them is on the National Register of Historic Places. It's called Novio Line Camp. It's the best representation of one of the line camps. They had three 
on the island. Uh, and the other two, there are parts and pieces of them still on the island, but the integrity of them is not great. Um, but Navio, folks can visit. They can walk right up to it. So those facilities, the line camps were only used seasonally when they were doing roundups. But they are still, um, you can still see what it might have been like. So we're going to take a little walk down to the Novia line camp and I want you to tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, why it's historic, what happened here, and um, you know, why what's remaining. Novia line camp uh, is a part of the open range cattle ranching operations in Texas, one of the last open range options in Texas and as such is an important part of the history of the state. So the buildings, the corrals, the structures here are historic because they are greater than 50 years old, but they're also significant. Therefore, there was a nomination to the National Register of Historic Places that was accepted, and Novia Line Camp was placed on the register, and that enables us to protect the integrity of this landscape. we seeing right here? So we've stopped next to a nice wetland area. We can see egrets in the distance. We can see that the water is relatively deep here and that we can tell that based on this vegetation. What you see these taller plants directly in front of us are called typha and that typha is typical of deeper water. So we've got some open areas here, some vegetated areas here, wonderful habitat for all sorts of species. We have very healthy populations of great egrets and great blue herons and all of the egrets and herons, um, the little blues. We also have the reddish egret, which is a state listed species in Texas. And I hear a meadowlark. You do hear a meadowlark in the background. Yeah, that's one of our grassland species that's here year round and they reproduce here. What are we seeing here? So right now we're looking at the bunkhouse and it had several doors and openings for airflow because of course there is no electricity and therefore no air conditioning. So when they were hard at work in the summer months in the roundups, they would have good airflow through here. It was always windy, just like it's still always windy. And they did have a windmill, which helped power their water source. So what's this part over here? So we're now standing in the kitchen area. So this is where they would have had their meals cooked. Uh, typically they would, of course, be having very simple meals, some things that they could pack in their pockets to go ride. Um, and then right next to us, we have where they ate their meals uh, when they were here in the lion camp. And so you have some corrugated tin here. Absolutely. So in the wind. Yes. When they built these line camps, not only this one, but the other two that are further down island, they used found materials. So just like stuff washes in now, stuff has always washed in, and a lot of that was pieces of lumber, pieces of metal, other debris that would wash in, and they would harvest that off the beach and use it to build. So a lot of these fence posts that you see, or on the corral, some of the transverse elements, some of those horizontal elements are pieces of lumber that were found on the beach. So four nations have owned Padre Island, Spain, Mexico, the Republic of Texas, and now the U.S. So Padre Bailly wasn't the first visitor here. In fact, there were Native Americans, of course. Absolutely. And early Spaniards. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about the three Spanish shipwrecks that occurred here in 1554. So in April of 1554, there were four ships that departed from Veracruz, Mexico, and they were on their way to Cuba, and then they were going to return to Spain. They were part of a fleet that had come across the other direction from Spain and that they had been waiting for more than a year to make the return journey. And so finally they were able to set out. They got blown off course 
and they wrecked off the coast of three of those ships wrecked off the coast of Padre Island. So it was called the Wreck of the 300 because the there's a written report that about 300 people were on those ships. We do have manifests for one of those ships uh, that showed who was on it and what sort of material it was carrying. And so those most of those 300 people attempted to walk overland from the side of the shipwrecks back to Veracruz, Mexico, which is, they thought, a lot closer uh, than what it actually was. And along the way, almost all of them perished. They had encounters with some of those Native Americans that you mentioned uh, that were not friendly at the time. So one of the members of that walking party who had been left for dead, who was assumed to have perished, the group went on without him, later actually made his way to Veracruz. And it is a written account from someone that he told his story to that is why we know what we know about the group of people that tried to walk back to Veracruz. There was, separately from those that tried to walk back to Veracruz, one person did make it successfully back to Veracruz by sea. And he came back with a recovery ship to try to recover the materials from those shipwrecks. And they were able to recover some materials, but obviously not all of the materials that were a part of that shipwreck. What did they leave behind and um, you know what happened to the remains of, of what was left? So the bodies of the ships are still out there. Um, they broke up upon impact for the most part, and so parts of the timbers, of course these ships were made of wood, and so parts of the timbers washed ashore and are presumably buried in the dunes. Uh, parts of them degraded over time and have just worn away over time, as things do. Some of the remains of the ships are still out there. Any buried treasure yet to be found? It's probably safe to assume that there are significant archaeological findings left to be made. And I think it's important to note that the excavation of these ships led to some very important Texas laws regarding the protection of antiquities and the conservation of artifacts. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So the shipwrecks were lost to time for hundreds of years, and it wasn't until the 1950s that um, a diver reported seeing remains of one of the shipwrecks, and a group later excavated that shipwreck, and that was done in a way that it was a private enterprise, and so it wasn't scientifically cataloged. So a lot of information was lost in terms of relationships of one piece of material to another by where it was found, and potentially things got broken, maybe along the way. Um, most of those materials were returned to the state of Texas and are now displayed in the Corpus Christi Museum. So visitors can enjoy them. And that's, that is why the Antiquities Code of Texas and other laws like it that protect historic features and artifacts and archeological sites are so critical because that way we can all learn from them. It's not a few people benefiting from them. It's all public can see the museum display, can learn from it, can learn a lot about Spanish material culture by the items that were on that ship. From the pottery to, as you were talking about the treasure, all of those things tell a significant story. Let's talk a little bit about the military presence here. There was bombing practice and Coast Guard patrols during World War II, um, all the while cattle operations were still going on. What do you know about that? So yes, the cattle conveniently moved out of the way when there were bombs <laughs> dropping. Uh, so at the tail end of World War II, the nearby Naval Air Station started training Navy pilots. And they started using Padre Island as a training ground. So we popped on over to the uh, park headquarters so this is called Caffey Barracks. Uh, of course, today it's now park headquarters, but when it was constructed, it was called Caffey Barracks because it's adjacent to the Caffey Target. There were targets every five miles up and down the island that the pilots in training would target with their practice bombs. And 
This was the facility that the folks on the island who were marking where those bombs landed, calling those pilots in, so on and so forth, this is where they were housed on the island during those operations in this cafe barracks. It's a pretty big building. Is it um, completely occupied by the Park Service? Are there uh, spare spaces in the building? We value every inch. Uh, it is completely occupied by the Park Service. At this particular moment in time, it is entirely vacant because it's about to be rehabilitated. It is an older structure, and so we've got some remodeling to do, um, and we're going to do that in consistency with the historic nature of the building. So I also understand that the U.S. Navy did a thorough search of unexploded ordnance, but yet sometimes pieces and things show up. Uh, when was the last time one was discovered here? So I believe that was in 2017 when they rerouted a portion of the road and uh, essentially reconstructed Park Road 22. There were some unexploded ordnance items found uh, during that time period. And it's, it's essentially to be expected in a sandy environment. So what's the protocol when uh, something like that turns up? So first of all, I call law enforcement because I am not an unexploded ordnance expert. And typically they also call in the military. Um, there is a park service, an exploded ordnance person in our region that we also call for advice. Oil and gas. What's the history of oil and gas drilling on Padre Island and how many operations are happening now? So the history goes back quite far, um, much farther back than the, the park itself. The park was established, uh, the legislation was passed to establish this park in 1962. And oil and gas predates that by at least 30 years, if not more. Once the first automobiles could cross the Laguna Madre to get to the island, um, extraction of minerals started. So there were many, many pipelines and drilling rigs and oil and gas wells throughout time. Currently, there are no active wells. Um, last year, we completed a project to plug 11 abandoned oil and gas wells, and the Texas Railroad Commission helped us with that. They were a tremendous resource to help make that happen. That was funded through the Restore Act. Uh, the Restore Council provided that funding, and we are continuing that project forward. We've got the wells plugged, but now we're working on the rest of everything that is still out there, like the well pads and the roads. I'm Lynn Riddick, and I'll have more with Shelley Todd after this short break. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. We all aspire to leave a legacy of good, right? One way or the other, our parks and public lands are all of our legacies. Join Wild Tributes for the parks community with apparel that pays tribute to where legacy roams. Together, we can and will make a difference for the parks. Join us at wildtribute.com. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to raise private support to deepen everyone's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, Foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the National Park System for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. I'm Lynn Riddick and I'm back with Shelley Todd at Padre Island National Seashore. Let's talk more about the natural habitats here. You mentioned the dunes and the prairies and the marshes. So we have some 
really unique habitats here uh, associated with the Laguna Madre, which is a hypersaline lagoon. It's one of only a handful in the world. And the barrier island dynamics give us a lovely area of tidal flats behind the island on the leeward side of the island. And those provide habitat for foraging, for the most part, for our shorebirds. So you think about your piping plovers, your red knots, and some of our threatened and endangered species. It's a great place for them to land and overwinter or to travel through. So red knots travel thousands of miles on their migration, and this is one of the places that they can land and rest, refuel, take off again. Our prairies are home to more of our terrestrial species. Definitely have some um, avian species, some birds living in our prairies as well. We have a wide variety of reptiles and mammals that call the terrestrial areas home in, in the prairies and the wetlands as well. I saw a coyote just today. We have a very healthy population of coyotes, yes. Go back to the hypersaline lagoon, Laguna Madre. And uh, as a, a younger woman, I used to go there regularly to windsurf. I had no idea that it was such a unique place. Why is it so salty? So it's primarily because Prior to human intervention, there were very few natural water exchanges. So there are now multiple channels through the island that are man-made that have been dredged through the island for navigational purposes. But prior to that, and still to some extent now, the extent of the island, 113 miles, it's a long way for there to be no interchange between, or very little interchange between the Gulf and the backside of the island in the Laguna. There's also relatively little freshwater inflow, so we don't get a whole lot of fresh water to dilute the salt water that is in the Laguna, and therefore it becomes hypersaline. All right, so we decided to walk out to Bird Island Basin. So Tell me a little bit about the Laguna Madre. We're standing here now taking a look at, uh, the sun is shining on the water, creating a lot of sparkles. So what's the Laguna all about? It's a great place to watch the sunset. Um, it's a shallow hypersaline lagoon. Most of the Laguna Madre is less than six feet deep. The Gulf Intercoastal Waterway is dredged through the Laguna Madre so that ships have a way to go north and south behind the islands in relative safety compared to crossing um, within the ocean, within the Gulf of Mexico. It's, the Laguna Madre varies in width uh, depending you know, where you are on Padre Island. It can be as narrow as a few hundred feet and as wide as six miles. Most of it is like the island, somewhere between one and three miles wide. And so this is a great spot for windsurfing. Um, what makes it so good? It is a premier uh, location for windsurfing. The folks that come here are uh, pretty religious about it. We do have that cross breeze from the Gulf that blows almost all the time, but certain days uh, the weather is just perfect for catching that breeze and uh, being able to surf on it. And it uh, looks like some kids are here to either windsurf or get some kayaks. Yep. Yeah, there's a windsurfing concession here uh, that has a concession with the Park Service, and they offer kayaks and boards um, to windsurf, or if you want to kayak and do some fishing, you can do that too. So tell us about where we are right now. So we're standing at the Bird Island Basin boat ramp and looking out, somebody's coming in, somebody's loading their boat. We've got some brown pelicans on the fishing pier, some laughing gulls over there too, and then out in the distance on this little spit of land in front of us, we've got a lot of white pelicans and a great blue heron and some small birds I can't really see well enough to identify from this distance. Birding, you've got 397 species of birds here, um, including some endangered and threatened species. Talk about those endangered and threatened species, and um, is there a great time of the year for birding here? Sure. It's always a great time to come birding at Padre Island. Uh, there's not a bad time of the year. A lot of folks come during the migration seasons, spring and fall, uh, but we do have significant overwintering populations as well. So say really any time between 
late September and late April, you're going to have a good time viewing all sorts of birds. That's not to say that between April and September is not good because it certainly is. It's just you might see different things. Um, we do have several threatened and endangered bird species, and we also have several state listed species. And of course, several other species are on the list of concern. So they're not on the federal endangered species list, but they are species of concern for other reasons on other sorts of lists. And all of them, of course, are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So um, one of our headliners is the piping plover, which most folks are familiar with. And we also have the red knot. So it's probably a little less known, but operates in a very similar habitat to the piping plover. They're shorebirds. We also have the eastern black rail, which is a grassland bird. It's a very cryptic species. It likes to hide and very rarely will it startle and fly. It usually runs away. So they're hard to see. They're hard to find. We don't know a lot about them, uh, but we do know that they have been sighted here. And so that's, that's an exciting finding and just making sure that the actions that we take preserve that species. So we also incidentally have the Northern Oplomoto Falcon, which is an endangered species. Uh, it's a, as the name implies, a falcon species. Looks very similar to a peregrine falcon, which we also have. And uh, they hunt in the grasslands and they make their nests in the tops of yucca trees. Typically, uh, some of them have uh, become a little more ingenious with human structures and they might nest on a telephone pole or that kind of thing. But in the wild, they typically nest atop uh, any sort of tree-like structure and in the grasslands, we don't have a whole lot of tree-like structures. So <laughs> yuccas are typically where they land. What kind of fish do people catch here? All sorts. Um, this is one of the premier destinations for shark, though, so um, a wide variety, but um, the Atlantic shark nose and the black tip and the bonnet head are probably the most common, um, but the shark fishermen out there might tell you, um, you know, they have their favorite spot, and um, I'm, I'm not the world's premier expert on shark fishing, but we do have quite a number of shark fishermen uh, who enjoy the surf fishing that's available. And the shark fishing is catch and release, I'm guessing? Most often it's catch and release, um, but Texas uh, fishing regulations do allow, and the park service uses the Texas regulations. So if it is a legal fish in Texas waters, it's a legal fish in the park. So we are standing outside your office and there's about 40 or 50 estimating uh, uh, child's pools, blue round pools, and they appear to have grasses growing out of them. So tell me what we're seeing here. Sure, you're seeing bitter panicum and sea oats that we have transplanted here in hopes to grow them, sort of a nursery type of situation, for a revegetation project that we have going on and for upcoming revegetation projects that we are planning in association with the oil and gas pads, um, that non-native soil material being removed, restoration of the natural grade of those areas, and then revegetation of those areas. So who's in charge of uh, keeping an eye on these and making sure they get the water and nutrients they need? So the primary caretaker of these uh, are a couple of biotechs uh, named Evan and Justin and our conservation legacy intern named Becca. She's been working on this project the longest and uh, she is the one who's noted the numbers on the edges of the pools and keeps track of when they get watered and how much. There are different treatments going on for different pools so we can maximize and um, the output of these. Padre Island is the only area in Texas where all five threatened and endangered species of sea turtles nest or rely on habitat in the seashore. Tell us about the sea turtles and whether they're making a comeback. So yes, all five species of sea turtles that are known to occur in the Gulf of Mexico have at some point in time uh, been recorded to nest here in the park boundary some of them much less frequently than others. So the most common nests are the Kemp's Ridley, which are the most critically endangered sea turtle in the world. And um, there's a long-term mark recapture study, a long-term 
nesting and cold stun sea turtle program that manages those species. We also occasionally get green sea turtle nests. We get them every year, just in much lower numbers than the Kemp's Ridleys. Much less frequently, we might wind up with hawksbill or leatherback uh, nests and so on and so forth. So many of us um, saw with great dismay the um, pictures of the cold stunned turtles during uh, what we call Snowmageddon in Texas in 2021. And uh, the turtles were brought to convention centers and other facilities to sort of thaw out. And um, then that happened again on a very much smaller scale uh, a couple of weeks ago when, when temps dropped into the 20s, not as cold as 2021. So does this kind of thing set back the restoration program significantly? So that very much depends on the species. So the sea turtles that were cold stunned both years that you're referring to last year and this year were mostly green sea turtles and were mostly juveniles. So our program focuses more on the Kemp's Ridley, which there were no cold stunned Kemp's Ridleys in Texas during either of those events. Why is that? Do they have a, you know, a greater ability to withstand colder temperatures? So no, they don't. All, all sea turtles are um, cold-blooded animals. So when the temperatures drop low enough, their bodies um, have a hard time moving. You know, just like when you and I get cold, we move a little bit slower. That happens to them. Um, and if it stays cold enough for long enough, they become what we call cold stunned or hypothermic. And so they need some help typically in those situations to avoid predators, to not drown, to avoid boat strikes. And so that's why there's a cold stun stranding network in every state that responds to those events. But for the Kemp's Ridley, they're not here at that time of year. They're in their foraging grounds uh, in warmer waters at that time of year. I see. So let's talk a little bit more about the Kemp's Ridley. You have a very popular um, sea turtle hatchling program here. Um, what's that like? So um, every summer there are releases of hatchlings and it, it is, as you say, a very popular series of events. Folks come from all over the country, all over the globe, in fact, to attend and to, to watch the freshly hatched turtles race into the waves. Uh, we should note that their racing is a little bit slower than other species. The Kemp's Ridleys, uh, their reproductive strategies mean that they move a little bit slower because they tend to hatch in large groups uh, versus the green sea turtle, which races to the water a lot faster. So you take the eggs out of the nests and um, release them on the beach so that the nests don't get run over by vehicles, is that correct? So yes, the, the primary mitigation strategy for having driving on the beach is to relocate the nests so that they don't get damaged. I'm Lynn Riddick and I'll have more with Shelley Todd after this short break. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That is why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people, inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. Nova Scotia, 8,000 miles of coastline dotted with colorful fishing villages, quaint coastal towns, and an abundance of scenic natural beauty. Home to two national parks, Cape Breton Highlands and Kajimakujik, Spend your nights under a canopy of twinkling stars. Spend your days exploring trails, beaches, historical waterways, and tons of cultural and recreational experiences. Visit novascotia.com today and start planning your natural getaway. The Yosemite Conservancy helps visitors connect with Yosemite through adventures, volunteering, and the arts. It's the only nonprofit dedicated to supporting Yosemite National Park and funds grants to improve trails, restore habitat, protect wildlife, and inspire the next generation of nature lovers. Learn more at yosemite.org. In addition to some of the best rates in the country, Interior Federal Credit Union gives back their members more than other financial institutions in the form of dividends and low or no fees. With higher dividend rates, you can earn more in all your accounts, like certificates, money markets, or even a checking account. 
They focus to make sure that their members aren't being nickeled and dimed every time they make a transaction. That's the beauty of Interior Federal Credit Union. I'm Lynn Riddick and I'm back with Shelly Todd at Padre Island National Seashore. So let's talk trash. Um, marine debris. I want to share a Google review I found. Quote, I was not prepared for all the trash on the beach. And I want to ask you, is this a fair review? Where is the trash and plastic, the marine debris coming from? And how do you manage that on such a long swath of beach? It's an excellent question. And unfortunately, there's no right or good answer. It's a challenge that we wrestle with all the time. Just last weekend, we had the Friends of Padre group hosted the Big Shell Beach Cleanup. It's an annual event where hundreds of people come and clean the beach. That's why we have the giant dumpsters in the visitor center parking lot right now. All of that debris ready to go into those dumpsters. So what you didn't see is there are two dumpsters that have already been taken away that were full of debris from that event. So we have a fantastic group of volunteers um, that organize other cleanup events. We participate in the Texas Adopt a Beach with the General Land Office. There's a group that does a cleanup at the Port Mansfield Channel. And so they come in by boat since it's 60 miles of driving to get there if you try to go in by car. We also have a fantastic group of locals that come out every week that call themselves the Trash Busters. And so they help us manage. Uh, and of course, our staff as well deal with hazardous materials that wash in, deal with the giant buoys that block uh, being able to drive on the beach um, that otherwise present hazards. We are subject to, we have converging currents here. So we are in the Texas coastal bend and it's also known as the devil's elbow, hearkening back to those shipwrecks. The currents converge here from north and south and create an area where we get a lot of wash in from both sets of water basins that drain into the Gulf of Mexico. We get all of the heavy silt uh, from the Mississippi and then we also get everything that's coming out of Mexico. But those currents converge and bring us all manner of interesting things. And, and we do let people know that once you pass a certain point, you're kind of on your own. You know, there's no guarantee that you're not going to run into something because a lot of stuff does wash in. We also have a long-term project um, that's part of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, um, initiative to manage marine debris, to research and track marine debris. And it's called the MD Map or Marine Debris Mapping Project. And so we have a site every five miles from the zero to the 60. So at the zero, the five, the 10, and so on. And every month we go out and we run a transect to record what's there so that we can have some idea of the scale of the issue other than anecdotal evidence, obviously, as your Google review shows. Yes, uh, most people are unprepared for the volume. And I do think it's a fair review. Thankfully, though, it's not as bad as it was. And uh, so there was another study that the park did back in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, and that resulted in a push to change some regulations that actually did help reduce the volume of shrimping nets and things like that that would show up on the shoreline and cause entanglements for wildlife. So you said the big cleanup was last weekend? Yes. Okay. So I thought the beach was very clean. I drove out there um, before I came to meet with you. They and did a I good job. There. Yeah, I was like, oh, this looks great. And I did notice the dumpsters full of trash and garbage. So that's a great program. And and I'm guessing, like you say, those volunteer programs are getting bigger and better, more organized, more frequent. And that's got to be a, a great relief to, to the park. It is a fantastic uh, resource to have those partnerships. We've also recently joined a partnership with the Coastal Bend Bays and Estuaries Program for the provision of biodegradable sort of onion skin bags that we can give to visitors. So every visitor who hits the beach has a bag to take back more than they came with. What are some of the more unusual things that you've seen washed up on the beach? So a bowling ball is probably near the top of the list. Um, what I'll say also is, I, I guess it must be visitors, 
at many of the mile markers, so there are mile markers at the 5 and the 10 and the 15 and so on, and, and it's a telephone pole with a sign on it that marks where you are uh, in relation to the zero, which is where you come off of the pavement onto the beach. And around one of those telephone poles, there are probably 40 or 50 baby dolls just attached to it. And around another one of those telephone poles, there are easily that many hard hats. So we get all sorts of stuff that washes in kind of in patterns, lots of flip flops, lots of shoes, and people will make decorations out of them uh, and, and hang them on the beach to kind of mark their campsite. So those baby dolls and hard hat displays are still there? As of the last time I drove up and down the beach, they were. I, that Now, the uh, Big Shell folks might have gotten them <laughs> <laughs> in the beach cleanup event. We do try to remove those um, at regular intervals to get that plastic off the beach. Let's talk a little bit more about driving on the beach. Um, I understand that Texas beaches are considered public highways and vehicles are permitted to drive almost the entire seashore. So what are the biggest issues with vehicular traffic on the beach? So safety is a big concern. Uh, you know, we do deal with high tides, with marine debris, as we've discussed, um, and it's not always optimal driving conditions. So people get stuck um, and uh, getting a tow truck to come and unstick you is very, very expensive uh, when you are 40 or more miles down island and the park service won't rescue you. You have to call in a private company, correct? Correct. <laughs> so we do sometimes have vehicle strikes of wildlife. And so of course that's a concern, um, which also happens on any other highway. I'm gonna show you a picture that was taken a couple of weeks ago and posted in another Google review of the National Seashore. So there's the photo. So the photo shows a semi-tractor rig the driver wrote in his review that he dropped off his trailer at the visitor center and camped on the beach in his tractor. And it's ironic because I was just telling somebody about the first time I came down to Padre Island in 1991, I saw a very similar thing, a tractor on the beach, which I, it was head turning and it wasn't very pleasant to see. So I was wondering if this is a concern for the park and does the park have any issues with big vehicles like that? So we talked a little bit about oil and gas history a while ago and one of the aspects of the oil and gas industry use of the island meant that there was an oil and gas management plan developed for the park and as a result of that oil and gas management plan there was an environmental impact statement and so the the impacts of large vehicles mud trucks, drilling rigs, things like that, have been examined and documented. And as a part of you know, the parks enabling legislation and subsequent law and policy and planning documents, those sorts of um, vehicles are permitted to be on the beach. Uh, we do ask that folks drive above the swash line or the rack line so that we're not crushing those invertebrates that provide prey to our shorebirds that are constantly in and out of the surf. You see them as the surf comes in, they walk ahead of the water. As the surf goes out, they walk behind the water, constantly pecking. They're searching for prey, and we don't want those prey items to be crushed. And so we do ask that large vehicles like that drive above the rack line, and there are other mitigation measures that we require for large vehicles like that as well. So 60 miles of beach, what kind of things do folks underestimate here? So we talked about that tow truck, right, and how expensive <laughs> that is. I'd say that's probably number one. Um, a lot of folks are not quite prepared for the wind and how windy it is here all the time. And so one of the things we struggle with, going back to the marine debris, um, things that don't wash in from the ocean. Unfortunately, we get a lot of those pop-up tent structures that people weren't quite anticipating the wind and they blow apart and then we, we wind up picking up a lot of those pop-up tents. So what would you say are the seashore's biggest threats? Could it be weather events, excessive visitation, changes in climate, uh, facilities, pollution trash? So I think you've hit almost all of those are challenges for the park. Um, 
you know, we're a barrier island on the Gulf of Mexico, so sea level rise is a challenge for us in many ways, including that we get nu nuisance coastal flooding now. Um, so the nuisance coastal flooding is when just a regular high tide reaches the dune line, and so that means that it may not be safe for visitors or park staff to drive on the beach because the tide is high for certain periods of time. and. It also can impact available habitat for species that are users of the beach. The marine debris, as we've discussed, um, is, is a major challenge for us and for most of the Coastal Bend shoreline. We are not alone in that uh, management challenge. So weather events are also a challenge. Um, in a world where we're looking at the possibility of more intense weather events, um, you know, we are on the coastline of the Gulf of Mexico. There have been many, many hurricanes pass by either nearby or directly impact the island in the past. There was um, Hurricane Allen in 1980, did a lot of damage to the Parks Visitor Center. Hurricane Hannah just in 2020 was the Category 1 hurricane that impacted the island south of the Visitor Center area, but it did some damage. Uh, the winds did some damage to some of our facilities. So certainly, um, managing the repercussions of severe weather events, including hurricanes and tropical storms, is, is a challenge for us. You've been here three years. Um, what do you like most about working here in this seashore? I really enjoy the view out my office window being the dunes in the ocean. It's hard to beat the, and stepping out the door and hearing the roar of the ocean. Very good. Well, Shelley, I want to thank you for your time today. I appreciate your expertise and your experience and your willingness to share your insights. So we look forward to hearing more about Padre Island in the future. Wonderful. Well, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Join us next week when Lynn Riddick takes us to LBJ National Historical Park in Johnson City, Texas. It's a unique unit of the park system in that it offers a comprehensive look at the life of an American president from his birth to his death and everything in between. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Rappencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Park's Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit nationalparkstraveler.org.